All right, Titus chapter 2, if you would, please. We'll continue in, in our study of, of Titus. And uh, uh, starting out in chapter 1, we have Paul writing to his uh, son in the ministry, Titus. And uh, uh, referring to, uh, Paul referring to himself as uh, a servant. And that uh, all of uh, things that he teaches and preaches comes from the word of God. And that should be manifested, uh, his life and the things that God wants uh, through uh, his life. Uh, and then in, uh, as he has Titus there in Crete to, uh, to get uh, pastors uh, in line for, uh, on the island. Uh, he, in chapter, starting in verse number 6, he gives them the, uh, uh, the things that uh, he is to look for in these men. And then warns him uh, later on in that chapter about those that are unruly and, and those that are uh, preaching false doctrine and, and what to do about that. That these uh, men uh, uh, were just, they professed to know God, but by their works they deny him. And we could see that in our lives today. And then uh, starting in chapter 2, he tells them, he gives them that conjunction, says, but speak those things which become sound doctrine. And uh, he says, you need to teach the truth. And uh, as he told Timothy, in season, out of season, and uh, you just need to teach the truth. You just need to stand for the truth, and that's what we need to do uh, in our lives uh, uh, today. And then he starts saying, as you're teaching this, he says, There's, there are five groups of people that uh, I want you to teach some things to. And they started with the, with the, uh, with the aged men. Now, I'm not going to tell you whether you're an aged man or not. And uh, you can pretty much figure it out for yourself. Now, uh, for somebody that uh, is, let's say, Jonathan's age, I'm an aged man. Okay? Uh, in that, because he'd look at me and say, wow, you're, you're pretty old. And, uh, but then I could look at somebody else in here, and I'm not going to look at anybody in particular, so I'm just look down, okay, and, uh, and say, well, you know, to me, they're an aged man. Or they're a very mature woman. Uh, in that, and uh, but uh, he said that, uh, and these weren't uh, were, weren't pastors; these were were just men within the church. He said there are just some certain things uh, that I want you to do, and he said that uh, with with the, the ancient is wisdom, and, uh, and and with age we should have wisdom, and by wisdom I mean the ability to discern right from wrong. I mean, by the time I get to my age, I should know what is right from wrong. I should have my, my, my life established to know uh, where I'm going. And he said, when these aged men then need to set the example for others to follow. And, uh, and some people say, well, I don't want to be an example. Well, you you're either are an example in the right way or you're an example in the wrong way. For, for people to see. Our lives are a living testimony day in and day out, no matter how old you are. And he said that they need to be an example uh, uh, in uh, having sound uh, uh, faith and having sound uh, charity and having sound patience. In other words, uh, they should have their moral convictions already in order. Uh, and they should be living those out. And they should know how to love. They should uh, especially love those that are good and uh, promote that which is good. And then they need to be patient. In other words, they need to know how to handle the trials of life. And uh, because people are watching your life. They're watching my life, especially if you're considered uh, in that agent. And then he gave instructions to the aged women. It said, uh, uh, and that they uh, are, to, uh, are to also be an example because uh, if they are doing what is right, their doctrine is the belief that dictates their behavior. What they believe about the word of God, how they, how they uh, 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 the, through their devotional life and through the preaching and stuff that they hear, that uh, in their behavior and their demeanor, uh, people will be able to tell whether or not uh, they are living a life of holiness. And they said there are just some certain things that they need to demonstrate to, to younger women and to others uh, in their holiness. And that was, uh, number one, not to be a false accuser, not to be a slanderer. Okay? Uh, not to get caught up in the gossip of the day. Not to, not to allow your, 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 your two ears or your mouth to do that which is wrong. And then it says also that they're not to be given too much wine. And, and uh, what that means is not to be a slave of, of anything. Not to allow the substances uh, in life to control us. Whether it be uh, uh, smoking, drinking, 
food, whatever, uh, in that to, to control us. And then they need to be teachers of good things. In other words, teachers of that which is right, the things that are right to do. They have a responsibility. Uh, we are told to teach uh, the younger. And sometimes uh, women are watching, the younger women are watching the, the older ladies' lives. And sometimes the things that they teach are better caught than they are taught. They're, they're watching your life. Now, our, our kids watch our lives, and, and uh, when, when a kid does something at home and, and uh, say, boy, I, I've seen that look on your dad's face before. I remember one time uh, just getting on to Robert when he was younger, and I remember seeing the look on his face, and I thought, wow, where have I seen that look before? It was on mine, and then I came to the realization the look on my face was the same look my dad had. I thought, whoa, man, that's scary. Anybody ever been there besides me? Okay, all right. Just one? Man. Well, anyway, and uh, so, uh, but, uh, so you have the, the, the older women and, and, the, and, the, and the aged men and the aged women. And then uh, we, my wife said, you rushed through this. So that was her way of saying, you better slow down and, and tell us a little bit more about that. And that was the obedience of the young women. They were to observe and to learn from the mature or the older women of the church. See, ladies, you're given a great responsibility because there are others that are watching your life and how you handle uh, situation, the situations of life. Now, as a, as a younger man, there are just certain people's lives that, that, that I have watched. And I know my wife is watching other people's lives, how they, they handle things uh, in that. But then in turn, we also know that people are watching our lives and uh, that they are to give uh, the years of their experience to the younger women and to teach them some lessons. And there were uh, eight different things that, that he points out here. He says, he needs the, you need to teach them to, to be sober. In other words, uh, how to have a, a sound mind and how to be disciplined or have a disciplined or a correct life. In other words, they are teach them how to manage their lives in being a wife and being a mother. And, and for some, even uh, how to embrace singleness uh, in their life. Hey, to teach them how to love their husbands. Remember we talked a little bit last week that in, during this time, many of the, the, the marriages and stuff that were at this time were arranged marriages. And so you really didn't have a choice on, on who you were marrying. And, uh, but uh, as a Christian, as somebody who knew Christ the Savior, that you were to love your husband. If you go to Ephesians, I, I think that, that the Lord has a great sense of humor because it tells men that they are to love their wives and wives are to have reverence or to respect their husbands. What's it easier for men to do? It's easier for men to, they, they understand, you know, order. And so it's easier for them to, to obey and to, uh, and to have reverence for somebody that, that, that's in charge. It's harder for them to love. What's it easier for women to do? It's easier for them to love. They're the loving ones. I mean, when my kids would come in from, from outside scraping their knee, they didn't come running to me. I'm the one that had the experience. I was a U.S. Naval Hospital corpsman. No, they ran to their mom. Why? Because she was like, oh, let me see that boo-boo. Oh, me, I was just like, scrub it off, throw a Band-Aid on it, get back outside. And uh, in that, you'll be fine. Get back in the battle uh, in that. And, uh, uh, but, but they were to teach them to love their husbands, to, to have that. And uh, then also to love their children. In other words, to be maternal. I, I remember uh, watching Crystal when she was uh, uh, just a, a little girl learning to walk. She would get things and she'd wrap everything up and hold it like this. And I thought, is it just automatic? Are girls just automatic? Do they just have this maternal uh, point in them somewhere? Uh, in that, and uh, um, uh, and she was that way, and then God blessed her with with four kids, and uh, she has gotten everything she wanted. Maybe she doesn't want it now. I don't know. Uh, anyway, and uh, I I like it. They're my grandkids. All right, and uh, but also to teach them to be discreet or to to have a self control about themselves, and also to be chaste or to be pure. And boy, if there's ever a need uh, for that, it's that in in this day and age, for women. For ladies to teach ladies to act like ladies in their dress and in their demeanor and things. Because the world is trying to get men to act like women and women to act like men so that there's no difference. I think men should be men and women should be women. That's the way God made us. There is a difference. 
I'm glad my wife's different than I am. I'm glad that she's made different than me. I like the fact that I have boys and girls and, uh, in my family and that they know what they are. It's just crazy what we, what we go through today. And all these, uh, yesterday I was at a, a fellowship meeting and they were talking about uh, how in the world today you have to accept things. And I guess there's a, a professor uh, in Arizona that identifies with being a hippopotamus. She thinks she's a hippopotamus and then that's what they so said. Fine. Next time I, I'm in Arizona, I'll go by there and throw a pumpkin in at her. And uh, they seem to like pumpkins. See if she'll eat it. If she wants to identify as a hippopotamus. And uh, I won't go any farther than that. And uh, in that. But also if they were to teach them to be keepers uh, of the home. And, uh, and also to be good. To be beneficial to those that are around them. Then lastly, to be obedient to their husbands. In other words, to be willing to yield themselves to God's order. And then it gets to the young men. And this is where, where, where we'll pick up tonight. Uh, look with me, if you would, at uh, verse number 6 of chapter number 2. And it says this. Young men, likewise, exhort to be sober-minded. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works... In doctrine, showing uncorruptedness, uh, gravity, and sincerity. Sound speech that cannot be condemned. That he that is of a contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Exhort servants to be obedient to their own masters and to please them well in all things, answering, uh, not answering again, not purloining, but showing good fidelity that it may be uh, adorned uh, to the doctrine of, of God and the Savior in all things. So let's look at the young men. Young men uh, are, are to learn obedience. Now Paul calls for young men uh, to be obedient. The word likewise there means uh, uh, after the same manner in the same way. In other words, it's good for us as young men to find a mentor, somebody that you can look up to. I learned, and I'm learning to be a pastor, and I learned it from watching a pastor, somebody who, who loves their people. And that, that's one thing I remember pastor saying. He says, I may not be a very good preacher. He says, but I strive to be a really good pastor. And he taught me how to go on hospital visitation. He taught me how to care for people and how to love people, how, how to be there for them. And, I, and I've watched him over the years uh, do that. Uh, Brother Chuck just happens to be here tonight. I was trying to just think of, of different things I've learned from people. I learned from Brother Chuck how to slow down and teach a class instead of trying to get all the lesson in in that, in that half hour that I have. You know what? Just teach what they need to learn and then you could just finish it out. That's why instead of it taking me 13 weeks to get through a typical set of lessons, it takes me six months uh, in that. I learned that from him. Why? Because it's, it's just patience. I've also always wished that I had his demeanor. And I strive. And I, sometimes I have to think, I want to be like Chuck. I learned how to pray from Brother Jim and Brother Steele. I learned how to, 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 to look past uh, 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 unruly people from Brother Marty. And to love people that, that, that come on the bus. I mean, I don't know that these guys know that I'm watching them. And there are other people in here that, that I can point out that, that I've watched and I, I've looked because I've wanted to learn things that I've seen in their life. But at the same time, I'm knowing that, that people are watching me. And says, so, so you need to set a pattern. You need to, to do that. But it's good for us to find mentors to help us to grow and to train to be a man. It says that we should exhort, in other words, the desire to, uh, to be sober-minded. In other words, to be in the right mind or to live uh, within normal limits. You know why? Because as young men, and uh, uh, we, have a, uh, uh, we are very impulsive. We're ready things to, to, to be done right this second. Or we, we just get the impulse to, to do things. And, and here, uh, to be sober-minded means to be curbing one's desire or impulses or to be self-controlled. 
And as young men, we need to find people that will help us to be held accountable uh, to do those things. So then it says, he, then Paul turns and he's talking to Titus. He says, listen, he says, you yourself as a young man need to be showing these things. You need to set the pattern for that. Uh, and there were two reasons why. Number one, uh, he was the one that was, was going around trying to find people to pastor. So he needed to, to set that example for others uh, to do that. And he says, showing thyself, he needed to model that. So what does a sound-minded young man look like in the eyes of Paul? Well, he needs to have a pattern of good works. That word pattern means a model or a type. In other words, you need to set the example. Now, it is, it is not uncommon for young men to have role models or a hero in their life. I mean, I, you, we could think of uh, maybe heroes that we had when we were kids. Remember when I was a kid, I wanted to be Batman. Old Adam West. And I thought that was cool. I wanted to run and jump on some pole and slide down and get in the Batmobile. My dad was so cool. We used to have this old Chevy car. And my dad, when it was just me and him driving and you didn't have to wear seat belts and I'd be standing right next to him in the car, he would look at me and he'd start going, do, 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 And he'd hit the gas and he'd hit that passing gear and then it'd really be going. And he'd go, Batman. And I thought, man, I was like, whoa, we're really going fast. We were probably going 30 miles an hour. I don't know. And in that, but to me, we were just going fast and I wanted to be Batman. Then pretty soon as, as I grew up, and I grew up as a, as a Navy brat, I started looking around at all the different sailors. You know who the cool sailors were? The guys that flew jets. Man, that pristine white uniform and those cool aviator sunglasses. I thought, when I grow up, I want to be like that because chicks will dig a guy like that. Uh, in that. God said, no, I don't think so. And uh, in that, I uh, made sure that I would never get there. And, uh, uh, and I'm glad that, 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 that my favorite chick didn't dig that. She liked the fat, old, grumpy guy. And uh, in that, all right. But, uh, but he was to, to model that. So he was, to, he was to pattern what? He was to pattern good doctrine. In other words, how to follow God's word in good doctrine showing uncorruptness. Now this word here does not occur anywhere else in the New Testament. And here it means this, means the same as purity, that which is not erroneous, and that which uh, does not tend to corrupt the morals of others or to endanger their salvation. Albert Barnes said everything in his teaching was to be such as to make men purer and better. In other words, you'd better to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Not just in your speaking, but in the way that you act and things that you do. And uh, in your teaching, following God's word. Then also he was to set a pattern for having a good attitude. That word gravity means dignity and, uh, uh, and also means sincerity, which means incorruptibility. Uh, Oliver B. Green said this. What Paul was saying to the young preacher is simply that he is to be honest, upright, above reproach in his teaching, his preaching, and in his living. He's, he is to be an example in any and all things that will ensure the respect from the church and from unbelievers as well. You know, people watch our lives. They watch to see how we act and react in, in, in all kinds of situations. And we, as, as young men, and, and, and Titus, as a young preacher, needed to set the example. They also need to set a pattern in good or sound speech. The pastor must exhibit the wisdom to speak only that which is well thought out and not that which is rash and, uh, uh, and, and just wrong. Well, that's, that takes practice, doesn't it? As young men, not to speak our mind. You know, I've often told people, I'm going to give you a piece of my mind, but if I do, then I won't have none left. And uh, it's not very big. And, uh, but, but as I've gotten older, I, I've learned to... I'm saying it up here, but I'm not trying to let it get out here. Not like when I was a young man. And you know what? I found out that, that proverb's right. A fool speaketh all his mind. A wise man keepeth it till afterwards says something like that. And if I don't say it, then I don't have to apologize for it. 
I just have to tell God because he heard me say it inside here. But I've noticed in watching older men that a lot of times they don't tell you everything just like that. It's a difficult thing to do. Now, any Christian should say nothing that will bring blame to their ministry or to their personal testimony. Paul, in writing to Timothy, said this, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachably. Here, as Paul is, is writing, he says that uh, a sound speech that cannot be condemned. Because once you say it, it's out there and you can't ever take it back. You can try to apologize for it, but you'll still remember. I still remember hateful things that people said to me in my life. Not that I dwell on it. It's not like I have like a little checklist. Well, this person said this about me. This person said this about me. But Satan's real good about bringing it back up. Trying to be divisive, trying to use it as a divisive thing in our lives. So we need to make sure that we watch our mouths. So let's just stop and think about this for a second. Here you have the aged man, the aged woman, the young woman, and the young man. It pretty much sounds like God's trying to tell us as a church something that we need to be careful, and that we need to be studied up, and we need to make sure that we are living what we say that we believe. The doctrine that we have will dictate our behavior. But then he has one last group, and that's this. Look at verses 9 and 10 again. It says, Exhort servants to be obedient to their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again, not prolonging, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. Now, in Paul's day, there were still many slaves and many slave masters. Some of the masters had, had gotten saved, while others had not. Hundreds of slaves during this time had been born again. And Paul knew that if the Christian slaves did not render the right kind of obedience uh, and service to their masters, that they would have a poor testimony. They, they'd serve as a poor testimony of the grace of God in their lives. Therefore, he wanted the servants to um, uh, the servants who were believers to be obedient to their masters, to serve them well, to please them in all things, and not uh, to be dis, uh, disputing and arguing with them. Because a such servant would never influence the master to become a believer. Paul knew that the, believer, the, the believing servants could win their masters if they could prove to them that Christianity saves, satisfies, and brings peace. Peace and position that money could not obtain. Philippians tells us there's a peace that passes all understanding that we as Christians can have. Now, uh, as, 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 uh, as Christian employees, we are to do what we are asked well and without complaint. As a Christian employee, as a Christian employee, let, let me say it again, we are to do what we are asked well and without complaint. In other words, uh, look at what it says. It says, servants, be obedient to your own masters and please them well in what? In what I want to do or in all things, all things. So let's just stop and think about it for a second. Now, to please them in all things does not mean that the servant is to dishonor God in order to please the master. But not only in so much as pleasing the earthly master does not contradict his belief with the heavenly master. Now, uh, the Christian servant or employee was not to do anything morally or spiritually wrong to please his master or, uh, or his employer. A Christian servant and employee was not to do anything uh, to uh, agitate or to antagonize uh, his master because of his faith in God. But... A Christian employee should do all that was in his power to win his master uh, by doing some things. Number one, by daily demonstrating the peace of God in his heart. People watch your life. I, I was given the opportunity to, to, to make a little extra money th this past weekend. All I had to do was pull these little trash bags out, put them in a trash bag, and then just go and dump them in a dumpster. 
And I did that for 16 bucks an hour, earning money to go on vacation. And the more I did it, the happier I got. I don't know why. I was happy. I was pushing that little cart. It was easy work. And, uh, and I just kept smiling. And these zoo people just kept looking at me. And finally, a couple of them just said, why are you so happy? I said, because I get to dump trash today. That makes you happy? I said, sure it does. Somebody's paying me to do it and it's easy work. I picked nothing up over 30 pounds, I promise you. I had my conscience by my side and she beat me. I probably wasted a lot of bags because I pulled everything out halfway. But you know, the, the more people watched, the more they just kept noticing. So it made it easier to give out tracks to people. If I'm showing the peace of God in my life through my work and I'm happy in doing my work, people are going to take notice. People are going to notice a difference in your life. If you're happy about doing what you're doing. Second thing is, not only are we to show the peace of God in our heart, but we are to, uh, but the testimony of the Lord through our lips. We're to speak the right things. Or to say the right things. The person that was in charge of me was half my age. Didn't matter to me. Whatever she told me to do, I said, I'll take care of it. Don't worry about it. I got it. Why? Because that was the person they put in charge. Well, I'm a 55 year old man. Why am I letting some 20-something-year-old girl boss me around? What's that sound like? You could say it. Per, 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 what? Pride, thank you. You guys afraid to say the word? Well, we could get real prideful about things, can't we? In our jobs. You know, I learned a real humble spirit from watching somebody that I work for. And there are many a days that I've come in at eight o'clock in the morning and pastor's already disheveled for the day. His hair's all messed up, his shirt's all untucked and his tie's a wreck because he's been fixing the toilet somewhere, repairing the lights or doing something. It's real easy to work for somebody like that. Is it not? You should be the employee that you want working for you one day. That's what Paul's telling them. So you need to be careful with your lips. Then also to render, uh, to in service rendering, uh, doing what you're supposed to do in your job. Now, listen to what uh, uh, Paul uh, said in Ephesians. He said this, Servants, be obedient to them which are your masters according to the flesh with fear and with trembling in singleness of your heart as unto Christ, not with eye service as man pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing that any doeth the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. And ye masters, do uh, the same things unto them, forbearing threatenings, knowing that your master also in heaven, neither is, uh, neither is there respect of persons with him. That's Ephesians uh, 6, 5 through 9. And then uh, the verse in Colossians three twenty two. Many of you can quote this. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men. You know what? Ultimately, I work for God. And that's how I need to work. Man, if, if pulling a trash bag out and taking it to the, to the dumpster is, is unto the Lord, I can do that. If making a, a visit to somebody is what God wants me to do, I can do that. Talking to James today, he called me to let me know what was going on. He said, he asked me to do this. I said, hey, let, let's pray 
that, that God will just give you uh, comforting words for, for that pastor and his wife that, that are hurting. The guy asked James, says, are, are you going to be okay to do all this? I said, oh, psh, you're an expert at that, going on the fly and preaching. And uh, we, sh- we should be that way. Now, as Christian employees, we should work with integrity. That word proloin there means to carry away another's property for one's own use. So what does it tell us? It says not purloining, but showing all goodness and and fidelity. In other words, we are to give an honest day's work for an honest day's pay. We should be the best employee that that company has ever seen. We should strive to do that. When uh, I was in Bible college, I, um, me and Tanya were, were going around filling out applications. We went and filled out applications at Sears. There was actually a job that she was trying to get. I just filled out an application while I was there. Well, the lady said, hey, wait, wait right here. The supervisor from the warehouse came out and said, let me talk to you. So we went into a room and, and he said, you have experience working in a warehouse? I said, yes, sir. He goes, I usually don't hire Baptist Bible College employees. They never work out. I was like, wow, that's a bad testimony. He says, but I'm willing to give you a chance. I said, yes, sir. So I went, work, went to work for him. His name was Larry Ray. He's my boss. Little did I know that he actually attended the same church I did. He didn't know that. I didn't know that. His son was in the junior high class that Tanya and I worked in. Didn't know that either. There were 80 7th and 8th graders in this class. We had the girls, what, Q through Z, something like that. And I think we had like 20, 25 of them that we were responsible for. In the three years that I worked at Sears, because of the work ethic that my father had taught me, by the time we got done, there were just as many Baptist Bible College employees there as there were from any other school. Because Larry, Larry would tell me, he says, hey, we, we need somebody. You think you could find somebody on campus that's dependable? And I made sure I looked around the guys that I was in class with because I wanted to keep my testimony. And we had men that were working there. An honest day's work for an honest day's pay because people are watching your life. Now, all of us have worked alongside people who work harder at getting out of work than actually working. Those people drive you crazy, don't they? But you know what? I'm working as unto the Lord. I can't worry about what they're doing. I, I, I just have to do what God wants me to do. We are not to take advantage or we are not to take anything that doesn't rightfully belong to us. Boy, it gets tempting sometime, doesn't it? And they've got extra this, they have extra that. We need to, to, to work with all fidelity, all honesty. And we are also to properly use what belongs to our employers. I've seen people abuse equipment and things. We are to use it right. Now, we have a couple of people in the Bible that had really good work ethics. When I think of people that have good work ethics, I think about David, who was a shepherd. And because he was faithful as a shepherd, he became a king. He was faithful in little things. And then there was Joseph, who was sold as a slave, who rose to power to save a nation. Both of these men had good work ethics. So as, as Titus is receiving his instruction from Paul, he's telling him, make sure that you instruct the aged men, the aged women, the young women, the young men, and the servants to do things as unto the Lord. Now, uh, Josh, would you go ahead and put up the first slide? Last week we sang this song, so I want you to sing it with me again. Ready? Obedience is to show that we believe doing exactly what the Lord commands, doing it happily. Action is the key. Do it immediately. Joy you will receive. Obedience is the very best way to show that you believe. O B E D I N C E. Obedience is the 
the very best way to show that you believe. Isn't that so much truth in that song? Did you know that there was a second verse? I didn't know this until I, I, looked, I looked up the song. Look at the words. It says, we want to live pure. We want to live clean. We want to do our best. Sweetly submitting to authority, leaving to God the rest. Walking in the light, keeping our attitude right on the narrow way. For if you believe the word that you receive, you always will obey. Now think about that. We could sing the first part, but can we live the second verse? Let's sing it together. Ready? We want to live pure. We want to live clean. We want to do our best. Sweetly submitting to authority, leaving to God the rest. Walking in the light, keeping our attitude right on the narrow way. For if you believe the word you receive, you always will obey. And let me ask you a question. Can you do it? We should. We should leave pure. We should leave clean. Isn't that the instructions that we were given in the book of Titus? Are we not to sweetly submit to authority? Are we not to be walking in the light? Are we not to have a right attitude? We're supposed to live what we believe. And that's what Paul was trying to teach Titus. And that's what Titus was to teach to the people. Next week, we're going to see what the basis of obedience is. If you want to read ahead, it's verses 11 through 15. We'll talk about grace, God's grace next week. Let's stand together with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, please. Just have a brief time of invitation. The altars will be open for you. If there's uh, something that maybe the Lord is dealing with you with or somebody that you'd like to pray for, uh, certainly uh, uh, you could do that. We're going to be singing, I would, like, I would Be Like Jesus. And that's found in page uh, 388. I would be like Jesus. Father, we just pray, Lord, to be this time of invitation. Lord, thank you, Lord, for the privilege it is to get to teach your word. And I just pray, God, that it would not uh, uh, find it void in any of our hearts, Lord, that we would consider where we're at, whether we're an aged man or a young man, whether an aged woman or a young woman. Lord, but all of us are servants. All of us work for someone. Lord, all of us need to be obedient, Lord, not only to you, but, Lord, in everything that we do, we should do as unto the Lord. And I just pray, God, that you would help us to do that, that we would set the right example. Lord, just be with us as we sing this song, uh, Lord, and, and uh, we just ask this in your precious name. Amen.